and really, David's attitude here is wrong. He has done a kind thing. He has done a gracious and humble thing. But he acts as though he's entitled to Nabal's stuff because of it. And if they're not going to give it to us, well, then we're going to take it. Okay, well, then that just makes you no different than a bully. That makes you no different than a thug or a roving band of, of bandits. Hey, fellow tacticians. Be sure to like this video and subscribe and ring that little notification bell. That supports this channel's conservative content, which is good for me, good for you, good for America, but really bad for the dark cyber overlords at YouTube. In 1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for The Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on tactics. Our Chaplain's Report today does come from the book of 1 Samuel, and we're going to look at another episode in the life of David. This one's going to be a slightly longer reading, but I think we really have to read the whole story to get the proper context, so let's go ahead and dive right in. Remember, this happens while David is on the run from King Saul. 1 Samuel 25, verses 2 through 13. Now there was a man in Maon whose business was in Carmel, but, and the man was very rich, and he had 3,000 sheep and 1,000 goats. And it came about while he was shearing his sheep in Carmel. Now the man's name was Nabal, and his wife's name was Abigail, and the woman was intelligent and beautiful in appearance, but the man was harsh and evil in his dealings and he was a Calebite, that David heard in the wilderness that Nabal was shearing his sheep. So David sent ten young men, and David said to the young men, Go up to Carmel and visit Nabal, and greet him in my name, and this is what you shall say. Have a long life, peace to you, and peace to your house, and peace to all, the, all that you have. And David rebuked his men with these words and did not allow. Uh oh, sorry, I'm, I'm missing one there. Don't know how that happened. Sorry about that. Uh, now then, I have heard you say that uh, you have shears. Now your shepherds have been with us and we have not harmed them, nor has anything of theirs gone missing in all the days that they were in Carmel. Ask your young men and they will tell you. Therefore, let my young men find favor in your eyes, for we have come on a festive day. Please give whatever you find at your hand to your servant and your son David. When David's young men came, they spoke to Nabal in accordance with all these words in David's name, and then they waited. But Nabal answered David's servant and said, Who is David, and who is the son of Jesse? There are many servants today that are each breaking away from his master. Shall I then take my bread and my water and my meat and that I have slaughtered for my shears and give it to men whose origin I do not know? So David's young men made their way back and returned, and they came and informed him in accordance with these words. Then David said to his men, Each of you, strap on his sword. So each man strapped on his sword, and David also strapped on his sword, and about four hundred men went up with uh, behind David, while two hundred stayed with the baggage. Just to place it into context without condoning one side or the other, or condoning the actions of David, you do have to understand, especially as soldiers and as a, a person that was in charge of men, David was somebody that very much lived by the honor system. In other words, when he was being honored, he showed honor to other people, and he tried to extend grace and honor to other people. But when he was insulted, he believed that there needed to be some kind of retribution. Now, we see this in like old movies. Culturally, this used to be something that was more prominent than it is now. Uh, for example, in ancient Greece, it was a, a very big deal to be honored by other people, and if you were insulted, you took vengeance on them for insulting you. Uh, this was also true in like uh, the medieval era with knights and chivalry. Uh, it was also the place where musketeers would do this. For example, in France, they, they believed that if you insulted them, that it was worth fighting over. 
even in more recent cultures, like around the time of our revolution, if you insulted someone bad enough, they would engage you in a duel. And so this is what's actually going on here. So you might think, well, it's, it's awful small and petty for David to do this just based on being insulted. And to be honest, I agree with you. However, it is important to realize that culturally, this is something that would not have been all that bizarre. Because it's not just that Nabal refused David's kindness and, and sort of, you know, spat in his face. On top of that, he went out of his way to insult him. When he says the phrase, well, who is David and who is the son of Jesse? He knows who David is. What he's doing is he's trying to say, you're of no consequence to me. You're, because even if he hadn't known who David was, he wouldn't have said it in this way. He is going out of his way to try to insult David. He's trying to say, you're nothing. Your name means nothing to me. I don't know who you are. Uh, you know, you need to go off somewhere else and don't expect anything out of me. Don't let the door hit you in the behind on the way out. Now, we're going to talk about David's reaction to that in a second. But right now, I want to really zero in on what Nabal is doing. First of all, it's important to note, and I don't know if this was really his name or this was added later by an editor, but Nabal's name actually does mean fool. That's literally the translation. And uh, his wife will actually make an, an analogy to this later, which makes me believe that this really was his name. But Nabal's name actually does mean fool, and he lives up to his name. And that's a, a point that the Bible itself goes out of its way to, uh, to point out. But this is somebody who, when met with great kindness from David, it really just kind of spits it back in his face. That David goes out of his way to try to extend some grace and some friendship and does ask for something in return, but he does so very graciously and humbly. He actually says, your son David, that is a term of humility. And so this is tantamount to David coming in very humbly, making a request, giving him honor, uh, treating him and, and speaking to him in a way that even shows submission on his part. And the first thing Nabal does is insult him. And so David, who is somebody that doesn't necessarily do this very often, you can understand why he's very taken aback by this because he was doing this and going out of his way to try to be humble and kind and gracious as possible and immediately is met with nothing but scorn and vitriol. And I think that we've probably all done this. That's a very difficult thing to deal with emotionally. When you go out of your way to try to be extra nice to somebody and their immediate reaction is to dislike you and to talk bad about you. I mean, that, that's a hard thing to deal with. Even for somebody that's pretty thick-skinned like myself, that is a difficult situation to have to deal with. And, and David is no different here. But it's important to also understand that when it comes to this request of he's a very rich person, He's got the means to do it, and David is asking for a little bit of help here because his men have been actually been helping out his people with his business. They have done work uh, to try to help them, to protect their flocks, that they've been among them, been living with them. And he's saying, so could we get a little compensation for that? Could we help out with it? And essentially what Nabal is doing here is he is openly rejecting an opportunity to do something gracious and to be hospitable. Now, again, this is something that we're kind of unconnected to in our culture, but you have to understand, especially in Jewish culture, this was a very, very big deal. Hospitality is something that is highly valued, and it goes all the way back to Abraham. You may notice that Abraham is very gracious about guests and travelers, especially when it comes to people like Melchizedek, like the angels that visited him, um, and, and specifically in the Old Testament, there's several narratives that take place before this where hospitality is met with vitriol like this, uh, whether it's in Sodom and Gomorrah, the whole ordeal with Lot, or the, the thing with the tribe of Benjamin later on, where people treat their guests and strangers in their town very harshly. Hospitality was a big deal to a Jew at this time. And the fact that Nabal had the opportunity to host guests and not only said no, but specifically went out of his way to scorn them that is something that was a very serious offense in Judea in this time period. And so once you understand the cultural context, you kind of understand David's reaction a little bit better. Nabal has done something very evil here. He's not only just not done, he's not only avoided doing something nice, he's actually done something wrong. 
And so David, in recognition of this, now reacts to it by taking his army and plans to go out and basically kill not only the ball, but anybody associated with him, the people that work for him, that kind of thing. He is about to take vengeance on the ball in an extremely harsh and violent way. This was a bad idea. David is actually painted somewhat as a villain here. And by the way, it spoils the story a little bit, but we're going to get to the fact that David himself even acknowledges this is not the right reaction here. But my point is, we see here that David is kind of being unreasonable. Because think about this. He comes to him saying, look how my men have been among your men and we haven't done any harm to them. We've actually been protecting the flocks. You can ask, we have the superior might, the superior power. We could have gone through and robbed them or taken things from them. We didn't do any of those things. We've been very nice. We were just passing through here. And notice that Ball's reaction to this is not good. But isn't it kind of weird that David is like, see how we've not done any of these things? We've not hurt anybody. We've not robbed you. And then when he insults him, he's like, okay, now we're going to rob you. Now we're going to. He's saying that this is the right thing to do and we've done this because it's it's right. But now we're going to not do the right thing because you didn't do the right thing to us. See, what David's doing is he is justifying his own bad behavior, his own behavior that he is admitting would be wrong. And he's actually testifying would be the wrong thing to do earlier by doing the wrong thing that he admitted would be wrong because somebody else did something wrong to him. It's the two wrongs make a right thing, and it's, it's just not good. It's not something that God would hold as a standard. Bad action never justifies bad action from somebody else. And really, David's attitude here is wrong. He has done a kind thing. He has done a gracious and humble thing. But he acts as though he's entitled to Nabal's stuff because of it. And if they're not going to give it to us, well, then we're going to take it. Okay, well, then that just makes you no different than a bully. That makes you no different than a thug or a roving band of, of bandits. And David, kind of short-sighted here by his own rage at the insult, doesn't see that. Since we were talking about Superman earlier today, I'll make a Superman reference here. One of the best scenes in Smallville, which is a, a story about Superman, Superman saves Lex Luthor's life when his car goes over a bridge. And his reaction to this is that he buys Clark Kent, Superman, a brand new truck. And as a 15-year-old, he's really excited about this. It's a brand new truck with all the bells and whistles. He's always driven like an, an old uh, GMC Sierra that's kind of a piece of junk. And so seeing this brand new shiny truck is something that really excites him. And then his dad doesn't let him have it. And he doesn't understand why. And he, he's arguing with his dad about why he should be able to keep the truck. And he says, Dad, I did save a man's life. And Jonathan Kent's answer is just one of the best scenes in the entire series, right there in the first episode. He turns to Clark and he says, do you think you deserve a reward for that? You think you're entitled to something because you saved a man's life? I expect you to save a man's life regardless, is essentially what he's saying. You don't do the right thing because you expect a reward out of it. You do the right thing because it's the right thing to do. And that's what God expects out of us. That's what he expected out of David here. God expected David to do the right thing, to treat other people kindly and with hospitality, even if other people don't do the same thing to you. That's what God wanted out of his servants and what he calls us to do to this very day. We don't just do the right thing when we're expecting to get something out of it, which is what David kind of does here. He expects to have his men fed and, and be able to take part in some of the things that he did after doing some nice things for Nabal and showing him some hospitality. I mean, it's kind of like people that uh, give you a gift and they get very upset when you don't get a thank you card. Now, granted, a polite person is supposed to do that. They're supposed to send a thank you card and, and be gracious. But if you got them a present just so you could get some gratitude out of them, you didn't really get them a present for the right reasons. And that's kind of the sentiment that Jonathan Kent is espousing and, and the same kind of sentiment that the Bible espouses. We should be doing the right thing because it's what God expects of us. Our Heavenly Father, just like in, in the Superman story, his father expected him to do the right thing because that's the person he raised him to be. 
You don't do it so you can get a reward. And once you do it, you don't expect to get something out of it. You don't deserve it for doing the right thing. That's, that's the bare minimum. That's what I expect out of you. And I think really the message to take home here is don't let another person's sin prompt us to sin. People are going to treat us wrong. People are going to persecute us. Jesus says, take up a cross daily and follow me. That is his command to his people. He's not saying you're going to be free from persecution. He's guaranteeing it. With that in mind, he expects you not to sin as the result of that. Just like he went through crowds of people, even though he was completely innocent, and was beat on and spit upon and mocked and ridiculed. And yet, he didn't react. He didn't, he, even though he would have been justified in taking vengeance on those people, he didn't. Because ultimately, he recognized that they're image bearers of, and God's children as well. And so, don't let another person's sin prompt you to sin. Be like Jesus and do the right thing, even when other people treat you poorly. Stay the course, friends. Ever wonder where Superman gets his incredible powers? Some people say it's the yellow son of Earth, but I think it's because he subscribes to this channel and likes my videos. Now, I'm not saying that if you subscribe to my channel you'll necessarily wake up tomorrow as a super strong, nearly invincible alien, but it definitely doesn't hurt your chances.